Yeah. All right. Uh, so it is uh, my pleasure to introduce Peter Hermitage from uh, John Hopkins. As we discussed, right, like a couple of minutes ago, this is his fifth attempt to give us <laughs> to give a talk in our uh, department. Uh, first three were for condensed matter seminars, and then uh, the, the second colloquium uh, tried. So we, we hope that uh, no technical issues will appear now. Uh, so uh, Peter got his uh, bachelor from Rutgers University in 94. And uh, then he moved to Stanford and he got his PhD in 2002, working with uh, the exchange. So apparently eight years in graduate school is not necessarily a bad thing, right? Uh, I took some time off in the middle, but it wasn't a bad uh, time, yeah. <laughs> I see. Yeah. All right, then, then he became a postdoctoral fellow in UCLA, working with uh, George Gruner. And uh, then uh, from 2004 to 2006, he was an NSF uh, International Research Fellow in University of Geneva, working with uh, Dark Van Marrell. And since 2006, he's faculty in John Hopkins University. Uh, he's also vice chair for research and uh, facilities, right, uh, on the department. And uh, so he, he, he won a bunch of prizes, and uh, such as Ludwig Gansel Prize for exceptional contribution to the field of condensed matter spectroscopy. He got uh, three years in a row. He, has, he was a Cowley Frontiers Fellow of uh, National Academy of Science. He got DARPA Young Faculty Award, NSF Career Award, Alfred Sloan Research Fellowship, and a bunch of others. I have listed them. Anyone who wants so, to I can send okay. them. I, again, he got a, a bunch of publications, and I was too lazy to count, but they were the majority of them was very high profile, PRL and, and nature, nature physics, uh, and, and, and so forth. Uh, he's been working on well and Dirac semi-metals, high PC superconductors, skin liquids, topological insulators, quantum critical fermions, pretty much all over the, the modern condensed matter physics. In the earlier days, he actually published papers on charge transport and relaxation mechanism in DNA. Yeah, which is a uh, long time ago yeah yeah so, I, you, you're not doing it anymore right no all right uh, so nowadays uh, peter's research centers on you can the... say that's a that's a solved problem there's no charge transport in dna uh, yeah. uh, there's, Use, uh, it's a it's a rare solved problem i see well but relaxation mechanism is still probably play some role right maybe yeah all right, so it's uh, uh, so he's interested in coherent quantum effects uh, like superconductors or quantum magnets or spin liquids, and uh, those, those effects where this is a major problem is how the collection of small uh, simple particles collectively make uh, produce some emergent, completely new emergent quantum behavior. That's that's some some of the most interesting questions in physics, in my opinion, and uh, that that's what his Peter is working right now. Uh, he's a world leading expert in using low frequency microwave and gigahertz range radiation uh, to probe those complex phenomena. And uh, he's been invited and given talks all over the world. In particular, I heard one of his talks already this summer. And uh, so, and today he's given colloquium on Ising model in, uh, in thermodynamics. Now, like any theorist would, I'm actually very tempted to start talking about the subject myself. But I will restrain myself and resist this temptation. And uh, so I give the floor, or what should I say, Zoom uh, to Peter, and I'll try to learn something uh, from him. So, Peter, it's yours. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Artem. And, and as, as he mentioned, uh, this is the, the fifth attempt to give a talk here. I, uh, you, Artem was nice, uh, very kind to invite me for a seminar last fall, which uh, got rescheduled for some reasons that I uh, can't recall right now, and then was rescheduled for the spring. Um, then we rescheduled, uh, that obviously didn't happen. We rescheduled for the fall and that didn't happen. And then my colloquium last week had some um, technical issues, but uh, here I am, uh, I'm virtually to College Station. I actually, I'm, I'm quite uh, sorry that I'm not there in person. I, uh, uh, half of my family is from Texas and I had, uh, my grandfather was, a, was an Aggie and uh, I have a bunch of cousins who went to Texas A&M. Uh, I had to look it up to remind myself what it meant, but uh, they used to, my grandfather used to talk about uh, uh, wearing senior boots or something to this effect uh, as part of the cadets. So he was uh, an Aggie in the class of 1946, I believe. 
And so uh, we'll invite you think... again later. When What's that? Okay. Yeah. Well, that would be would be nice to uh, to visit sometime. But uh, I've never been to College Station, and I look forward to being there in person sometime. So um, I'm going to tell you today about um, uh, a material system, uh, a particular material system, cobalt niobium 206, and our experiments on it. And hopefully, telling you about a particular material will not be considered too prosaic. Um, this material system is the best example we have of the easing model that we can tune in transverse fields. The easing model has been at the forefront of statistical mechanics and quantum mechanics for over 90 years. I'm also gonna tell you about the history of the easing model and Ernst easing. Um, I think this general topic should be interesting for, this, for, you know, for a general audience as historical developments of the easings model show a disregard for traditional academic boundaries. I think it's fair to say physics, metallurgy, mathematics have all been involved. Some of the most recent applications, of course, have been in biology. Uh, the most striking success in the theory of the easing model involves such challenging mathematics that it stumped all the physicists who attempted to solve it. And finally, it had to be solved by a chemist, of course, one with a, a particular um, scientific, uh, mathematical ability. When you look at a quantum mechanical version of it, it's the simplest case we have of quantum criticality, which is the as which is an aspect which is still at the forefront of modern condensed matter physics. And it's amazing in a system as simple as this one dimensional chain, analogies to phenomena and mathematical structures as diverse as quark confinement, fractionalization, Majorana fermions, area functions, and a 248, 248 dimensional E algebra can be found. I want to tell you about the research we've done today, and I want to tell you about the work that we've done on this particular material system. Um, but I'm also going to give you a kind of a broad background, both to uh, some of the, the small contributions that I've made to the history of this. But if I have one real goal today, it's to give you have a feeling how physicists like myself um, and colleagues uh, try to realize simple Hamiltonians in real materials. And it's challenging to look for simplicity and beauty in something that comes to you as a nondescript lock, ro uh, lump of something, which might actually have started life as a, as a rock in the ground. Cobalt niobium 206, which we call columbite, was first discovered actually as a class of minerals discovered in a Puritan farmer's field in Essex, Connecticut in 1626. It's columbite for Columbus for, uh, for, for the new world. The material, and I will get back into this more later on, but this is the material here, cobalt niobium 206, columbite. Uh, that's what the crystal structure looks like. This is what it looks like in the Natural History Museum in New York City, where it's again, uh, begins can begin life as an igneous rock blown out of a volcano. Um, we grow it in a traveling solvent floating zone furnace at Johns Hopkins University. We grow it with much more purity than the volcano, but actually much smaller. You can find natural crystals of columbite, which are 10 centimeters across. Before I tell you about it, let me thank all the people who made the work possible. So um, foremost, my former postdoc, Chris Morris, uh, my colleague, Oleg Chernyshoff, and his student, Anurbam Ghosh, my colleague, Tyrell McQueen, Bob Kava at Princeton, and his former student, Jason Krijan, my colleague at Johns Hopkins, Syed Kopia, uh, former postdoc of mine, Rold, Rolando Valdez Aguilar. Uh, we've had a great collaboration that has gone on just recently with Rebo Call at the University of Kentucky. Actually, I actually was giving this colloquium. It was the last place that I went before everything shut down in February and was discussing, as I will, at the end of the talk, some things that we didn't at that time understand. And, uh, and Rebo Call and I got to talking afterwards and uh, were able to, to work out the remaining details, which is really a kind of a, a beautiful addendum to the story. His student, uh, Nishida. Um, and then a collaboration as well with uh, Thomas Rooms Group in Estonia. And then uh, I'm not going to talk about it so much, but uh, there was also a theoretical collaboration that happened with Sabir Sashtin. Okay. I'm going to tell you about the what and why of, uh, of the easing model. Uh, I'll tell you about the history of the easing model, Ernst easing and beyond. I will, as I mentioned, tell you about cobalt niobate, which is the best material realization of easing's model. And then I'll tell you about the experiments we've done, terahertz experiments on this material in zero magnetic field where we have evidence for what can, by analogy to what was discussed in the particle and nuclear physics journal, refer to as nine meson bound states in the system. And then we'll take the system and we will tune it through a quantum critical point, uh, through a zero temperature phase transition with a transverse magnetic field. And uh, this is perhaps the simplest example we have of a quantum phase transition. And we have 
evidence there for universal numbers which come out at the quantum phase transition, what is called Kramers Wangye duality, and a particular kind of magnetic interaction, which is really also at the forefront of modern kinetic matter physics, that's the so called Kitai of interaction. So that's the Ising model. There it is. Uh, this is the simplest nearest neighbor case. And we know that for 1D, only t equals zero has long range order, the finite magnetization. And uh, Ising argued that the, the same thing was true in higher dimensions, that there was no phase transition in the Ising model at any temperature. And we know that's not true. In fact, higher temperature, uh, excuse me, higher dimensional, higher dimensions than one has a finite temperature phase transition. Uh, the Ising model is written here, has a two, two-fold degenerative ground state. That'll be important for things we discuss later on. Up or down spins can be selected, okay? And there he is, and there is his thesis, Ernst Ising in 1925, around the time where he published his only scientific paper, this thesis in Hamburg, 1923, 1924. And one only has to look at the original paper to know that the problem was given to him by Lenz his thesis visor. So it's lens of Lenz's law, the minus sign in magnetic induction. In fact, Ising himself called the model the, the lens Ising model. And I'm going to call it the Ising model just for the, the simple reason that it makes my story better. Ising intended his model to be a good microscopic model to explain ferromagnetism. And it's not that. It's both less than that and more than that. And, and that's, in fact, the, the subject of my talk today. So in 1924, Ernst Ising published his thesis in Hamburg and showed that there was no phase transition in one dimension. And he argues that the same is true for higher dimensions as well. And in 1925, he published his only scientific paper, which was about single author, which was about the results of this. I think it's fair to say that the, the history of the Ising model is long and winding. <coughs> and complete results were long and coming, but even when they came, the recognized significance of them, for instance, the idea that there are universal aspects to phase transitions, this took even longer. And I think it shows that there's really more to physics than just solving problems. One must realize in how some particular results fits into a general context. And, and now, of course, physics is, as we understand it now, physics is really the search for universality, but, but perhaps it was, it was really not always the case. So the problem that Lenz gave to Ising had two parts, and uh, both parts were impossible. So a good, a good thesis advisor. So um, in the first part, he had to derive the model, uh, a model for the interaction of one magnetic unit that prefers alignment with another magnetic unit. So this is, of course, a problem which belonged to the just invented and, of course, underdeveloped quantum mechanics of the time. We call this mechanism super exchange. And it had to wait until uh, John Goodenough at the University of Texas did foundational work on this in the 1950s. In the second part of the thesis, also impossible for him, he had to calculate analytically the 3D macroscopic magnetization with the methods of statistical mechanics that existed at the time. And, and of course, both of these problems were too big for easing. So the first to, to make any progress at all had to at least wait until Heisenberg in, in the late 20s and early 30s. And uh, the second part, to calculate the magnetization had to at least wait till Onsager in 1941 to calculate it in two dimensions. And of course, the three-dimensional Ising model is a, is a still unsolved problem. So Ising had to restrict himself to a much simpler version of everything. He had to assume some form of interaction for the first part, the interaction between the magnetic units, and he had to restrict himself to one dimension for uh, the second part of the problem. So Ising solved the one-dimensional case exactly. Um, he solved it with uh, sophisticated methods uh, at the time of using transfer matrices. Many students do a related calculation. Uh, we do it, I'm teaching statistical mechanics to undergrads now, and uh, they do a related calculation in my course this semester. He calculated the one-dimensional model, got the partition function, found that there was no singularity, no discontinuities as a function of temperature. Uh, and uh, calculated, uh, concluded from that that there was no fate, co concluded correctly that there was no phase transition. So this is a page from his, from his paper. It's kind of in slightly unfamiliar form here, but you might recognize it. So this is the formula for the magnetization um, as a function of, of uh, here in, uh, this is for, um, uh, as a function of, of, of small magnetic field. The uh, case here for, uh, this is, uh, let's say the result of a simple calculation that's done by many undergrads in their for a statistical mechanics course. In red here, we plot the energy per spin 
and blue is the heat capacity, right? And so as Ising found, right, that there's no singularities or discontinuities or anything in these curves. They're smooth as a function of temperature. The, the, the spontaneous magnetization and zero magnetic field is zero. And um, uh, this was in 1D, of course, but Ising had some particular arguments that the same would be true in two dimensions and three dimensions. Um, and that there'd be no phase transition at all. And of course, uh, that's wrong. There is, of course, phase transition in the Ising model in two dimensions and three dimensions. So at the time, Hamburg was a hotbed for this kind of thing. So uh, Pauli had just accepted a position there. Also present in Hamburg at the time were Stern and Gerlach doing their famous experiment. Ising ex intended his model as a description of ferromagnetism. And as the model didn't show ferromagnetism, he considered it a failure by that standard. Uh, uh, he, you can read this uh, quote that he wrote in 1967 to uh, historian of science, Stephen Brush. I discussed the results of my paper widely with Professor Lenz and with Dr. Wolfgang Pauli, who was at that time in Hamburg. There was some disappointment that the linear model, by this he means one dimensional chain, did not show the expected ferromagnetic properties. And this disappointment was, was uh, in part what motivated Ising to, after his PhD thesis and publishing of a single scientific paper, was, was to leave research. But th the general idea that a phase transition was, was not found was important too. Um, phase transitions, of course, have been noticed since the early days of physics, since the early days of, of people. Something non-analytic happens as a function of temperature. But what was not realized by early practitioners was that the thermodynamic limit was essential. So many thought that something beyond conventional statistical mechanics, as understood by people like Boltzmann and Gibbs, was going to be necessary. Even as late as 1937, uh, Sommerfeld has said that, that a partition function could only represent a particular phase of matter. And each state of matter had its own partition function. And the argument was essentially that since all thermodynamic functions is, are embedded in partition functions, and partition functions are sums of exponentials, a sum, sum of analytic functions, which exponential is, couldn't have a, a non-analyticity in it. And so what they didn't realize, of course, again, was that the thermodynamic limit was essential, is that uh, indeed a finite sum of analytic functions is analytic, but an infinite sum of analytic functions could have a non-analyticity in it. And, and so uh, the fact that Ising showed that one dimensions had no transition, but then claimed the same for higher dimensions was, this was highly misleading. Um, and you can see, of course, that for instance, these comments of Sommerfeld came 12 years after Ising's um, uh, his paper. Uh, of course, we've, we've had our revenge on Mr. Ising. And uh, in, at least in North America, we almost universally mispronounced his name as, as, as Ising, not, uh, not Ising. It wasn't until later that uh, the, the idea to study the easing model as a model for phase transitions in general caught on. So the concept, uh, concept of the easing model is a mathematically interesting object that existed independently of any particular approximation for a physical system. This seems to have started in the, in the Cambridge group of Fowler in the 1930s. And so anytime one has a, has a binary variable, uh, spin up or spin down or atom there or atom missing, um, anytime you have a binary variable, you can, of course, map it to the Ising model. And in this regard, uh, Piles had an had a important paper in the title of my talk today the, the, on Ising's model of ferromagnetism comes from, is the same as, as Piles' paper. So um, in that paper, um, um, he uh, says that one can look at a number of these different phenomena. For instance, um, he recognized the similarity of the Ising model to um, Bragg and Williams and Beta's theories of alloys, Fowler's theory of what was called the liberation rotation transition point in solids. He says that these are all physically different, but mathematically equivalent. Of course, in the 1940s, uh, the, the, the epochal moment of, of Onsager solving the two-dimensional easing model exactly um, is, uh, this is of course in incredibly important. Uh, because it establishes indeed conventional statistical mechanics, if you're really smart, can give you phase transitions by, by, a, by an exact, exact transition. So um, the, some years later, Yang gave a formula for the magnetization. Um, but I think it's still fair to say that the idea that the easing model uh, 
would be useful and important was not realized. And, and I find the attitude towards many of these successes quite curious. Yang himself was to have said that the easing model wasn't useful because it wasn't realistic. Um, I found at some point in reading the history about this, some uh, story about Oppenheimer introducing Yang to some other people at a Christmas party and saying to them, well, you should come over here and meet Mr. Yang. He's done a wonderful bit of mathematics. And, and really what Yang had done at that time was uh, give a formula for the exact formula for the spontaneous magnetization two dimensions. He showed uh, later with, uh, as also done by Onsager and Kaufman, that the critical exponents were at one eighth, right? tremendously different than the mean field result. And I, I find it quite remarkable that these seminal results were discarded as a bit of mathematics. Um, it wasn't really until later, I think, that 1960s that the notion of universality started to appear along with the recognition that, that critical phenomena were a research area by themselves. And um, uh, it was Fisher, Dom, Winham, others, they realized that, that what was important about the easing model was not that it was a realistic model for ferromagnetism because it, it usually is not, um, but that it was a good model for critical phenomena in general. And if the easing model could be applied to, and one can get exact agreement with the easing model to liquid gas transitions, binary alloys, then it has indeed some realism in it that's not connected to being any good model of any of these phases of matter, but more being a good model for the universal aspects what, uh, that unite them. So I, I, this idea of this kind of beautiful thing lurking was, uh, was really not found for a long time. And now, of course, we recognize that that uh, we can classify phase transitions according to their exponents, that only the dimensionality of the order parameter and the dimensionality of space matter. And we realize that the important thing is not the Ising model is or is not a good model of a particular ferromagnet, but that is a spin model. It's a good model for aspects of liquid gas phase transition and written in the right fashion with the right units and uh, the right kind of mapping between variables, there's exact correspondence between things, for instance, like the liquid gas phase transition and, uh, and uh, the, say the easing model, 3D easing model here in, in, uh, in three dimensions. Okay. The, um, the a major aspect of modern condensed matter physics is the study of quantum phase transitions where we study the change of a ground state as a function of some non-thermal parameter. And so the easing model in transverse magnetic field, which I'll discuss a little bit later, this is the, uh, the simplest example one has of a, of a quantum phase transition. Again, the zero temperature transition from one state of matter to another state of matter. Um, and so it's important also in the modern development of, of quantum mechanical aspects of, of cooperative phenomena as well. And you can see in chapter four of Sachdev's book develops all of this, uh, the formalism of, of quantum phase transitions in the context of the Ising chain in a transverse field. And now, uh, of course, the Ising model is everywhere. Of course, it's there are magnets. This is a plot of the reduced magnetization versus the reduced temperature of a single atomic iron layer over 36 orders of magnitude of reduced magnetization. So uh, it's, I mean, this is a really quite remarkable result. Uh, iron is not, uh, has really at a microscopic level has nothing to do with the original idea that Ising considered, which was the local interaction of two moments Iron is, of course, a metal, but uh, we now understand that, uh, you know, that the notion of universality class, that the dimensionality of space and the dimensionality of order parameter is what matters for the critical phenomena. But the easing model is everywhere. As I said, lattice gas models and binary alloys, uh, easing model is applied to cancer growth, biological phenomena, social segregation and, and racial, uh, racial clustering in, uh, in, in, in American cities. Um, you can even find papers that uh, tell you how to use the easing model to avoid paying your taxes. Uh, and there's a so-called easing model of tax evasion. You can look this up on the internet. So um, the remainder of my talk today, what I wanna do essentially is, if you will, turn back the clock on all of this progress. So I wanna ask, I wanna come back to easing's original idea and ask if, can we realize uh, a real physical system and investigate it, a real physical system, which is a good example of Easing's model, e.g. a ferromagnetic chain that, uh, that we can study in real materials. And so how, how would we realize such a thing? 
Well, we want it to be 1D or quasi 1D. We want it to be spin one half because we want the spins to be up or then we want them to be down or at least maybe a pseudo spin one half. We, we like small exchange constants, small interaction energies. And so that we could at least hopefully manipulate the state by, by applying magnetic field to it. We'd like it to be ferromagnetic, although it doesn't have to be. That was the case that easing considered. We need it to be having an easing anisotropy, meaning the spins point in one direction or they point opposite that to, to that direction. And we'd also like there to be no competing interactions. These are, we're gonna be looking at real material systems which have all kinds of other possible effects coming in. Uh, phonons, lattice vibrations, other kinds of things. And so it was pointed out some years ago by Radu Koldea that this material, cobalt niobium 206, which we call columbite, is perhaps the best material realization of the one dimensional easing chain. It is, as I mentioned, the material class was first discovered as minerals. It was discovered in 1626 in a farmer's field in, in Essex, Connecticut. Columbite is for Columbus, for the new world. That's what it looks like as a mineral. Um, as I mentioned also, you can get very, very large uh, uh, versions of this 10 centimeters across. This is what the crystal structure looks like. It's a zigzag chain where the magnetism is on the cobalt sites. The cobalt is a very strongly anisotropic ion as well as we can discuss. Um, this zigzag chain is of course, there's the zigzag is of course laid out in a funny uh, pattern in a, in a lattice, but we're gonna introduce the interactions between neighboring chains later on as a bit of a, as a perturbation. Let's see how we can get the, the easing model itself. So there's this uh, crystal structure zigzag. So uh, let's first, uh, they got spins on those sites. We can, um, for instance, let's say get rid of the oxygens and just worry about the cobalts there. Um, it's a zigzag chain, but um, let's not worry about that for now because it's just nearest neighbor interactions. So in fact, it doesn't actually matter for a lot of the physics that we're gonna care about is a nearest neighbor chain doesn't care if it's zigzag or not. In fact, it turns out that the zigzag, zigzag is gonna be important for some other details, but I'll come back to that at the end. So there are the spins and in cobalt niobate, the spins actually are at a funny angle of 31 degrees. But that actually doesn't matter either. We can just kind of do a coordinate transformation and rotate them all to be straight. Let's get rid of the cobalts altogether. And then we just have spins. And so that's our, our, uh, our cobalt niobate, uh, our, our easing chain in one dimension. Um, those are the excited states of the system. We would take a spin and we would flip it, of course. And so those are what excited states look like. Now, Cobalt niobate is, uh, we want to understand it as a, as a zigzag chain, but let's think of it as essentially just these ferromagnetic chains. But it is, of course, a full three-dimensional material. And there is a very weak coupling from one chain to the neighbor. And what actually happens in this system is you cool it down. You cool it down below, let's say, around 20 degrees Kelvin. You start to get these very, very long correlations along the chains. And then there's a weak interaction between the chains. And so at some low temperature, those weak interactions between the chains, which are anti-ferromagnetic, cause the neighboring chains to align with each other. And you can actually see this in the data. This is the heat capacity as a function of temperature. Zinc niobate is a non-magnetic version of this system. And so it just shows like a normal heat capacity due to the lattice vibrations, which comes down. But you can see what happens here, cobalt niobate, around 20 Kelvin, that's where these one dimensional correlations start to begin in earnest. And this deviation here represents indeed these correlations along the chain. This is a blow up. And then you get this peak and a shoulder and there's two low temperature phase transitions of which the lowest temperature one is the one that we most care about. And that's this transition to this ferromagnetic chains with the anti-ferromagnetically coupled neighbors. Now, one of the things that I mentioned was that um, we need strong easing anisotropy. And uh, the cobalt ion has that. You can see that experimentally, at least some aspects of it in the following way. So as I mentioned, uh, you have the zigzag chain and we have a A, B in C directions. And the spin here points at a funny one angle of 31 degrees. And if I put a magnetic field on the system uh, along the A direction or the C direction, I can cant that spin and the system magnetizes. You can see that here. This is a plot of the magnetization as a function of the temperature. And you can see that the system magnetizes as a function of temperature when I put a small magnetic field on it. 
The spin doesn't want to go in the B direction. We're going to want to put the magnetic field in the B direction later. That's the transverse field direction. But what you can see is, is that when I do a similar experiment, I put the small magnetic field in the B direction, the system just doesn't magnetize at all. And uh, that, that's the hard direction. And so what this shows you is that there's very strong anisotropies in the magnetism. And in fact, this anisotropies in the magnetism are such that they point in this 31 degree direction here. Right? So this system has this kind of anisotropy that we care about. Now, going back to, to the easing model, this is the 1D chain, and that's the, the simple Hamiltonian written in a different language than easing had written down. But um, what we're going to want to understand is we're going to take this system and we're going to want to perturb it with other magnetic fields. Okay. Um, so we can imagine, for instance, perturbing it with a transverse magnetic field. We imagine that on every site in the system, this spinner sits, which is either spin up or spin down. The transverse magnetic field, which we can think of as pointing, let's say, into the page here. You can see what happens when you operate this guy on the spinner. It has the effect of a spin flip, right? So the transverse magnetic field looks like a spin flip from a quantum mechanical perspective, OK? Now, let's think a little bit about what happens in this material here. Now, I said at low temperatures, you get these ferromagnetic chains which are anti ferro coupled to their neighbors. Right? Now, um, excitation of the system is a spin flip. Now, one of the things that you learn in, fin in physics in general, but you certainly learn in spin systems, is that very frequently the variables that you're kind of simply presented are not the, the simplest variables for understanding a system, the best variables for understanding the system. And that's true here as well. So uh, the simplest variables are, of course, the spin flips. But it turns out to be more appropriate not to focus on the spin flips, but to focus on these blue dots, which are the domain walls between regions of ferromagnetically coupled spins. Right. So this is one kind of ferro region where all the spins are pointing down. And I want to think of the intrinsic degree of freedom not as the spin flips, but as the domain walls. Now, one of the things that you can see happens here is that because of this, these are the chains themselves want to be ferromagnetically aligned but they want to be anti-ferromagnetically aligned with respect to their neighbors. And so one of the things that you can see here in the language of these blue dots, there's a linearly confining interaction that goes up linearly in the separation of the blue dots, right? So as I separate the domain walls apart from each other, the interaction between them, it goes up as a linearly confining potential. Now, if the system was pure easing, that would be the end of the story, but it's not. There are other terms in the, in the Hamiltonian that are like this transverse field term, which have the effect of a spin flip, okay? Now, in the language of spin flips, right? So we have these other terms here. In the language of spin flips, these things look like these are spin flips. But in the language of the blue dot, as I flip, let's say, this spin here, it corresponds to a tunneling term of the blue dot. So it's this kinetic energy, essentially. So I have a linearly confining potential, and I have a kinetic energy of the blue dots. And so it turns out you can take this and go to a continuum model and write it down in terms of a one-dimensional Schrodinger equation in this fashion here. So I have a kinetic energy term, which has to do with the tunneling of those blue dots. And I have the linearly confining potential here. If this was x squared, it would be solved. We could solve it in terms of our old friends, the Hermite polynomials, but it's not x squared, it's x. So we have to solve it in terms of our new friends, a class of special functions called Airy functions. The energy eigenvalue structure has this particular form here, where you have these z sub j's, where these z sub j's correspond to the negative roots to the area functions. And this is something you can just look up in some uh, mathematical table or look up on the internet. But um, that, that there was this mapping between this kind of continuum model to the, to the Ising model was actually first pointed out in this paper in Physical Review D. Physical Review D is, of course, the particle physics journal. This was done by McCoy and Wu. They were interested in this idea of the Ising model in this context because this linearly confining interaction is very reminiscent that of the linearly confining interaction that happens between two quarks and a meson. So it's a confinement confining interaction in this fashion. And so there's an analogy to quark confinement here in QCD where these domain walls are kinks in the, in the, the structure are quarks and the bound, their bound state is, uh, is a meson. Okay. So um, 
this is uh, the kinds of experiments that, that we're going to be doing. We do time domain terahertz spectroscopy. I don't want to go into the details of how we do these experiments. Uh, let me just say that we use a laser, an ultra fast laser, which is propagating around the table, goes through a beam splitter, sends part of the laser here, part of the laser there. It goes to a device which makes terahertz radiation. The terahertz radiation is in the form of a picosecond pulse of radiation. You can see this pulse, single cycle pulse of radiation is about a picosecond long. And uh, inverse of a picosecond is a terahertz. And so the Fourier, this pulse has as its Fourier content, all of this Fourier content, which is down in the terahertz part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Traditionally, the terahertz part of the electromagnetic spectrum was very challenging to measure materials. But now through techniques like this, we can actually measure things very, very well. Usually when we're measuring some material, we're interested in the response of the electric fields in the system to the electric dipole degrees of freedom, right? The electric degrees of freedom. But if a material is, let's say, electrically uninteresting, it is uh, an insulator, if electrically uninteresting in the terahertz range, but it has interesting magnetic degrees of freedom, then the time varying magnetic field of the terahertz pulse can couple to those magnetic degrees of freedom and we, we can excite them. And that's in fact what we're doing in, in, this, uh, in this experiment here. It, it forms a, a kind of, if you will, broadband effective electron spin resonance. Okay. That's what data looks like, raw data looks like. This is uh, the signal as a function of time here. You see that there's a number of different echoes. It's time domain terror spectroscopy. So we scan out to very long times. The longer we scan in time, the better the energy resolution that we have is. Um, these kind of echoes here, they're really echoes. They correspond to light entering this pulse, entering the sample. And then we're doing an experiment in transmission, but it's really, the light is really rattling around inside a slab of this material. And every time it bounces, kind of some light escapes. And uh, then you see these echoes. It's, it's literally a, literally a uh, electromagnetic echo. Okay, so uh, this is a plot of the, the absorption through the system. It's essentially the magnetic susceptibility as a function of frequency. I've stacked them apart from each other and uh, uh, at different temperatures, right? So we start from high temperature and go down to the lowest temperatures. And recall where I said that these one dimensional correlations start to set in. That's at about around 20 degrees Kelvin, right? And so you start off at high temperatures and there's not much there. And then you cool down and you start to get this kind of double peak spectrum or again around 20 Kelvin. And then you come in below the low temperature transition. You go just really, you move by a 10th of a degree and you just boom, all of this sharp spectra comes up. And this is really quite a remarkable curve. Those of you who are, have some experience with uh, spectroscopy and solid state physics may marvel at these curves because we don't usually have such sharp spectra to, uh, to, to, to take measurements of. So let's look at the lowest, um, let's look at the lowest curve here. This is the absorption versus frequency of uh, the lowest temperature spectrum in the system. And there is here a bunch of peaks, one, two, three, four, five. We're gonna call these M1, M2, M3, all the way up to M9. And then there's another peak, which is kind of out of the series. And then there's this big broad blob that we call the M1 plus M1 continuum. So let's, let's see what these things mean. So this is a plot of the energy versus some index excitation number of the lowest nine peaks, M1, M2, M3, M4, da, 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 all the way up to M9. And there is the model of McCoy and Wu, who in 1979 wrote down this continuum model for the Ising model in Physical Review D, the Particle Physics Journal. You can fit the whole discrete spectrum with two free parameters. And uh, based on these area function uh, uh, perspective. And I find it really quite remarkable, you know, the, this kind of the beautiful simplicity, this special function that comes out um, as a result of doing macroscopic experiments on a material system that could have started life blown out of a volcano. Um, okay, so what else is there? Here, this is actually where this, this quark analogy is useful. We know we don't have such a thing as free quarks in the vacuum. And that's because, let's say, if you pull on two quarks in a, in, a, in a meson, you eventually put in so much energy that it's sufficient to pop new quarks out of the vacuum. And you're left holding not free quarks, but uh, two, two new mesons. And that's essentially what happens here as well. You hit an energy threshold, which is approximately twice the energy of the, the lowest energy peak. And you excite, when we excite the system, we always excite it with zero center of mass momentum. 
And so we excite the system and eventually we excite two, not M1 peaks, M1 particles, but two M1 particles, which are propagating apart from each other with zero center of mass momentum. And there's a continuum of states that's associated with that. Um, there's also this other peak here, which um, in the language of quarks refers to, actually we believe corresponds to a four quark bound state where there's um, this kind of, you, one can convince oneself that you have this kind of funny interaction between chains, which forms as a result of this interchain interaction. You know, so you can imagine you know, three spin flips on one chain and two spin flips on the other chain. Um, you may recall from elementary quantum mechanics that every one dimensional potential always has at least one bound state to it. And so for this funny, let's say trapezoidal shaped potential, there's a bound state and, uh, and, and, and that's it there. This 2M1, again, in the language of quarks corresponds to, to a four quark bound state. Okay. Now, um, when I got interested in this material system, I was primarily actually interested in taking it and tuning it with magnetic field through the quantum phase transition, applying a magnetic field and putting it through the quantum critical point. And I was in my office one afternoon in a fall some years ago, um, thinking about the easing model and transverse field as, as one does, when my computer beeped and I got, I got an email. Dear Dr. Armitage, enjoy these pictures of my father for your talk, Tom Easing. Um, that's Ernst Easing there uh, in, uh, in uh, a few years before he passed away. Uh, this is the picture I showed you earlier. The Tom Easing is uh, a retired, is the only son of, uh, of Ernst Easing. He's a retired doctor living in Priora, Illinois. And uh, what resulted from this was for me anyway, a remarkable uh, correspondence where I got to learn quite a lot about uh, the, the history of this family in, in uh, quite a number of aspects, which uh, I don't think had been revealed, uh, revealed before. Um, as I said, that's Ernst Easing around the time that he published his PhD. He says, uh, Ernst Easing was born in Cologne, Germany in 1900. And I think it's fair to say that the events of his life run parallel and through the major events of the 20th century. He got his PhD in 1924, as I mentioned, but he was disappointed by his self-perceived failures. And he worked for a year in a patent office. Um, let's say uh, he worked with less success in that regard with other notable patent clerks around that time. He, um, he didn't like it and he decided to become a teacher. And he went to Berlin in 1928 to study philosophy and teaching. And there he met a woman named Joanna Eimer, who was a doctoral student in economics. Uh, they were married in 1930. That is a picture of them on a camping trip in the 1930s uh, on the Danube River. Um, Easing taught in various German high schools until January of 1933 when Hitler came to power. Easing was Jewish and the, the racial laws that were implemented meant that he went essentially unemployed for a year. This was the beginning of what uh, Jane uh, Easing, Joanna Easing, uh, later called 12 years on a tightrope as she described in her, in her memoirs. In 1934, he got a job as a teacher for Jewish children in an experimental school near Potsdam, Germany. And due to the, the times, the school expanded due to an increasing number of Jewish children in 1937. He became headmaster of the school. It was actually an experimental school and you can read about it on the internet. Um, uh, as a teacher had said about the school, uh, had said, although terrible things were ongoing outside, inside was a oasis, um, a oasis in the desert. It was described as without syllabus, without state recognition, but with a lot of music, a lot of freedom and a lot of music and singing. Easing uh, clearly cared deeply about his students and also them, and many of them came to the U.S. eventually. Uh, of course, many of them having lost much of their families in advance, and uh, uh, they kept in touch with this uh, older man who had taught them math and science. And Tom Easing has told me that he met them many times, and one of them even became his godmother, and uh, they spoke many times of, of the care that Easing had for his students. Uh, the Nazi threat was constant in those years, and there was vandalism of the school, and threats to the students who are ubiquitous. The, um, the uh, easing and the founder of the school made repeated attempts to get protection from the local authorities, which were always refused. Uh, they were told that 
that there was no reason to promote such facilities. Uh, quote, the applications are presumptuous and the terrible actions by the community were dismissed on the grounds that they were justified by the popular anger because of the Jewish home in Kaputh. Kaputh is this uh, small town near Potsdam where the school was. And uh, in those years in the late 30s, the teachers prepared for something, for something bad to happen. Um, Betsy Rosenthal is uh, the only surviving student who's over 90 years old living in London now. Uh, she tells that the students at that, in those years were taken for many walks in the woods that they only later realized was to figure out escape routes. And on the, on the November morning in 1938, there was this crystal knock, right? This pogrom against Jewish education centers and businesses in Germany. Uh, a crowd of 120 gathered in front were delayed by the founder of the school and easing and a number of the other teachers took the students out the back and through the woods, uh, the school was destroyed in that morning and was never, was never re reopened. In the early morning hours of uh, in January 27th, 1939, Easing was taken in by the Gestapo and interrogated for four hours. And he was dismissed eventually after he promised to leave Germany. So he went to Luxembourg with his pregnant wife with plans to emigrate to the United States. His sister lived in, in New York City. But let's say uh, apropos of the current age with quotas for immigration, uh, they required them to remain in Luxembourg. And in the spring of that year, the, the, their son Thomas was born, 19, spring of 1939. In May of 1940, one year later, the Nazis occupied Luxembourg, which put them at risk for, for deportation. Um, and they thought for quite some time that they might be deported and, and sent to the camps. And unbeknownst to the Easings, and, and after some uncertainty, it was eventually decided that by, by the Nazi hierarchy that Jewish men married to non-Jewish women and Jane Joanna Easing, who was born Jane Eimer, was non-Jewish. Uh, it was decided that Jewish men married to non-Jewish women would be the last to be deported and sent to the camps. And so Easing was forced to work for the German army until liberation. And they essentially just outlived the war. He was one of only 36 Jews who survived, who survived the war in Luxembourg. Um, in April of 1947, they arrived in New York City and uh, Tom Easing was seven years old. And I've been very interested to know what Easing knew about work on the Easing model. So this is 1947 and recall, of course, that uh, this was after the Onsager Revolution. Uh, which Pauli had said was the only important physics that had happened during the war. Um, uh, Tom Easing had told me, uh, we can read it here, it was only at 1947 physics convention in Boston to get a teaching job did he learn that anyone knew of his thesis. My, part, my father apparently looking for a teaching job, going to a physics convention in Boston as he was meeting people. There were some familiar with the Easing model, which came as a complete surprise to him since for many years he had not done any teaching at all and had been completely out of contact with any physics and had no idea that anyone had ever heard of his dissertation. He was also probably somewhat embarrassed since he had been so out of touch and did not want to show ignorance. Um, it's actually not clear if this is, uh, this is what Tom had told me, but I have to say that it's not clear. There's some reports from, um, the, he ended up at a university in the Midwest and there's some reports from various newsletters there that Easing in fact didn't learn about the Onsager solution and all of the other work until 1949. Uh, so some years after he'd already been in the United States. But uh, Easing um, spoke many years later that uh, it actually turned out to, to be good to, to learn that he was famous in physics to find a job in physics. So again, you realize that uh, the Easing model had become by the 1950s a major area of research, but uh, was almost entirely, the man himself was, was almost entirely unknown. In 1948, Easing became a professor of physics at Bradley University in uh, Peoria, Illinois. Easing's passion was teaching and he always would say that a class had not gone well unless the students had laughed at least once. He liked fine arts and poetry and he could actually recite classical German poems from memory well into old age. And this was actually reflected in Easing's second publication, Goethe as a Physicist, which was published in um, the early 1950s, uh, April 1950, Goethe as a Physicist in the American Journal of Physics. You can see here Ernst Easing. This is actually his second published paper and discusses Goethe, the, the German man of letters theories on, on light and color. Um, that's Easing there. As I said, his passion was teaching. And here you can see he's using one of these 
wheels, bicycle wheels that we use to uh, demonstrate angular momentum. And uh, this is a cartoon that I found at uh, Bradley University that I show just because I think it's funny. Uh, they, uh, they've taken the same cartoon and for some reason turned the bicycle wheel into a spaghetti strainer. Um, I, I post it without any comment. You can see though, uh, somebody knew some physics because in the background here, there's uh, some uh, hyperbolic function written. And if you're familiar with the solutions of the, of the easing model, you know that the hyperbolic functions play an important role. In 1953, uh, they got their United States citizenship and new names. Uh, this is presumably when uh, Ernst Easing became Ernest Ising and Joanna Easing became Jane Ising. Um, in 1976, he became an emeritus professor at Bradley University. And on May 11th, 1998, Ernest Ising died at the age of 98, having had a long and productive life. For her part, Jane Ising, Jane Ising, taught economics and German in the public schools in Priora, Illinois, and in Bradley University. She founded the Planned Parenthood of Priora, Illinois. She swam every day until her 100th birthday. And in the morning, February 2012, Jane Ising died on her 110th birthday. And uh, Tom told me that they'd been planning a, a birthday party, which they went ahead with anyway, which was a cake with 110 candles on it. This is a picture of her at uh, the age of 109. Um, this is a picture of uh, Tom Easing, their only son, uh, in Mersch, Luxembourg, which was the small town where they survived the war at the dedication to the Rue Ernst Easing there, which is a, a road which was uh, renamed in honor of Ernst Easing. Incidentally, Tom, uh, Tom Ising was a physics student at MIT in the 1950s. And uh, he told me that uh, not once in four years was he asked a single question about the, about the Ising model. So it apparently hadn't entered the, the teaching of undergrad physics uh, that much yet, yet at that time. OK, so. Um, I have much still to say and uh, very little time to say it, but in my remaining minutes, I, I wanna give you a feeling about the, about the direction we're going now. And so a lot of the physics that I've talked about is the classical case, but with these kind of quantum mechanical terms that we added as perturbations. Or here, I, I wanna make things explicitly quantum mechanical and where we're gonna tune a quantum phase transition. So a quantum phase transition is a phase transition as a function of a non-thermal parameter. So it's a transition in the ground state of a system. Um, we know that there needs to be a change in the ground state as a function of transverse field here. There needs to be a quantum phase transition in the Ising model. So the Ising model at, um, at zero magnetic field is, as we've discussed, it's uh, twofold degenerate. Right? All the spins can be up or all the spins can be down. But if I put a really large transverse field on a system, I could take all of the spins and I could push them completely in the transverse field direction. And that's a singly degenerate ground state. And you can't go between the singly degenerate ground state and the twofold degenerate ground state without something discontinuous happening. And so this is the simplest example we have of, of a quantum phase transition. Quantum phase transitions are, are, a, are a central area in modern condensed matter physics. Uh, they believe to be relevant to some of the unusual physics and cuprate superconductors, heavy fermion compounds, and they're, they're an interesting object of study all by themselves. In general, quantum phase transitions are, 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 um, are characterized by a collapse of energy scales near a quantum phase transition. So as I tune the transverse magnetic field on a system, I go from being, again, a twofold degenerate ground state to a singly degenerate ground state. But there's a certain energy scale for making a spin flip in the system, which comes down continuously and goes to zero another energy scale, which comes back up on the other side. Many quantum phase transitions are characterized, uh, and phase transitions in general actually are characterized by what we call duality relations. So what this means is that a description on one side of a phase transition allows itself with some kind of appropriate variable transformation to a description of the other side of the transition. And that's in fact true here. There's something that's called Kramer's Vanier duality, which relates the elementary excitations of the ferromagnetic side of the transition to the elementary excitations of the paramagnetic side of the transition. 
it happens in a particularly interesting fashion. And it turns out that in a fashion quite related to as we've already discussed, the elementary excitations, the excited states on the ferromagnetic side of the transition are these domain walls we talked about earlier, right? So you can convince yourself that the lowest energy excited state of the system corresponds to not just a single spin flip, but in fact, let's say half the spins in the system up and the other half down where all of the spins are happy except the ones at the domain wall boundary. And again, we're gonna think of this domain wall or the kink state as some people refer to it as the elementary particle in the system, not the, the, not the, the elementary excitation, the, el the, the fundamental degree of freedom, not the spin flips themselves, okay? Um, on the, what we call the high field side, the paramagnetic side of the transition, the elementary excitations actually are spin flips, right? So we have all these spins, let's say pointing with the field, and then I can take one of those spins and I can flip it backwards, okay? Now, um, there's a duality relation between the two sides of the transition. And if I write my easing model in this way, let's say this is my interaction terms here between the spins, that's the transverse field term here. I've written in terms of G, which is a, let's say the dimensionless magnetic field written in this fashion. One thing I can see is that the energy gap here has the form of 2J times one minus G, whereas on the paramagnetic side, it's 2J times one minus G in this fashion, the absolute value of it. So the gap comes down as a function of G, the gap goes to zero and then comes back up on the other side. And again, there's this duality relation. If I know what's going on with these excitations, I can figure out what's going on with these excitations here. But there's something extra here. And that's because the ferromagnetic, ferromagnetic itself is very interesting. Um, the, we can't make one of these domain walls by itself. We have to make two at a time, right? A photon comes in and flips a spin. And when it flips one spin, that actually corresponds to two domain walls. Um, uh, neutron, same thing with neutrons. Neutron can come in and flip a single spin and it corresponds to two domain walls being made. So when we look at the spectra on the ferromagnetic side, versus the paramagnetic side. On the ferromagnetic side, there is, if we imagine that there's a gap delta of the elementary, the energy of an elementary excitation, we actually see a gap two delta on the ferro side. Whereas on the paramagnetic side, it's just delta itself, okay? Now, um, and so what you, the, the prediction is, is that as you, you get this collapse of energy scales, but it collapses twice as fast on the ferromagnetic side is on the paramagnetic side. And, and this is in fact uh, exactly, uh, exactly what we see. The, um, there is this kind of narrowing, uh, the thing I will point out here, this is these, this is, uh, the data is taken in a slightly different fashion that I was taking earlier. And so there's some other features in there which we have to unfortunately interpret as artifacts. But the essential point is that there's this peak which comes down and then comes down to zero energy and then comes back up on the paramagnetic side. So this is increasing field as I go upwards on the plot. Many times in, in modern condensed matter physics, people are trying to infer something about quantum criticality by extracting a scaling relation. And really what they do when they're doing that is they're trying to pull out this collapse of energy scales near the quantum critical point. We don't have to do any of that. We just measure the collapse of energy scales directly. Now, if I plot the lowest energy feature here as a function of magnetic field, on the ferro side and the para side, I see that the gap comes down exactly twice when it comes up on the paramagnetic side. There's a factor of two here. And in the easing model, as I implied on the previous slide, this is a universal number. It's a factor of two, which is an exact number close to the quantum phase transition. This is a consequence of what we call Kramer's Vanier duality. It actually goes back to the to the late 30s and early uh, and uh, uh, late 30s and early 1940s by Kremers and Vanier, shortly before Onsager solved it. Here, it's applied to the one-dimensional uh, zero-temperature phase transition. So it's, if you will, this aspect which has been discussed for many many years. The measurement of this universal number here, two, is the first direct evidence for Kremers-Vanier duality and, and the topological conservation of what we would call domain wall parity in the system. There are other interesting consequences here. And if I had more time, I would tell you all about those. Uh, it actually is related to the fact this kind of narrowing of the spectrum is this is the upper edge, that's the lower edge. This kind of narrowing of the spectrum is actually related to this aspect that I told you about in the beginning, which was the zigzag nature. 
And the consequence of the zigzag, we don't have to get them to rough physics, we don't actually have to worry about it. But the zigzag has a consequence of introducing an internal magnetic field, transverse field, which switches sign between each bond in the system. And so when I tune it with transverse field, some of those transverse, when I turn it with external transverse fields, some of those transverse fields go up and some of those transverse fields go down and it leads to an overall narrowing of the spectrum in this fashion. So um, um, we have a recent paper on this and this was all uh, kind of worked out by, uh, by Ribu Call. And as I said, in the, in the last colloquium I gave in February before everything shut down, uh, was discussing some of these aspects. And uh, uh, Ribu pointed out to me that this kind of internal magnetic field can come microscopically as a result of what we call a Kitaev interaction. That uh, in addition to the zigzag, every bond is actually slightly tilted with the one next to it. And this solves a number of problems, uh, things in the system. This is, uh, uh, in addition, what's the source of the quantum mechanical motion of domain walls when we have zero external field. If you're interested in this, I'm happy to talk more about this, but I think I'll probably uh, just uh, finish up there. I'll just point out just the really kind of beautiful correspondence between the experiment here in transverse field and, uh, and Ribu calls theory here. This is the DMRG calculations. And uh, that's all I wanted to say. So uh, I hope I've uh, uh, taught you a little about the easing model and, and current progress on it. I've, uh, I've told you about the what and why of the easing model, the history of Ernst easing, the easing model in general and, and Ernst easing, and told you a little about the experiments that we've done, cobalt niobium 206, uh, what we call columbite, which is the best material realization of easing's model. Um, I told you about the experiments we did at zero magnetic field, nine meson bound states, at low temperature. And, I, and I've told you about the work that is ongoing right now, um, uh, actually out for review as we speak, uh, and that is on the, the transverse field. How does one tune the, the ground state of the system and all of the kind of interesting uh, and uh, subtle details that are involved in understanding that. So I thank you for your attention and uh, I'm, uh, I'm happy to take any questions. All right, thank you, Peter. Uh, it was very interesting. Uh, so, uh, are there any questions? Yes, I would like to know the origin of the uh, effective mass in that Schrodinger equation. Hmm. So, uh, you mean in the one D Schrodinger equation? Yes. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So, um, so it comes. Yeah. So it's the it, best to think of it here as a kinetic energy. So uh, where did I go here? Right. Okay, so there's two answers to that. I'll give you the simple answer first. Um, uh, the first part of it is that if we think about tuning the system with transverse field, the strength of uh, say that how much we mix into the system, the spin flips corresponds to the strength of the transverse field, right? So this SX term here corresponds to a spin flip Larger fields means more spin flips mixed into the system. And a spin flip is, corresponds to the tunneling of the blue dot, right? Which was this degree of freedom. So a system with a little bit of tunneling corresponds to a large mass. So for small magnetic fields, there is a, um, for small magnetic fields, there is a large mass and for large magnetic fields, there's a small mass, you increase the mass effectively as you, as you tune the transverse field. Now, a detail of it is that, as I said, the easing chain, there was, a, there was actually a mystery here that, that everybody was ignoring in this field until recently. And that is when we have zero external field that I apply as an experimentalist, what's the source of this kind of effective field? And it turns out that the source of this effective field is that each one of these spins, it's not only is it in a zigzag chain, but every Ising axis is slightly canted with respect to its neighbor. And so there's an, because of the zigzag and the twist, there's, it looks like an effective field, but one which switches sign from site to site. It has, a, and so this gives only, uh, only some details, but the, but the essential point is that the size of that twist mm -hmm. sets the strength of the tunneling, which is effectively how the mass is set. Got it. Anyone else? No. Hello, Larry.
Uh, can you? Um, yep, I can hear you. Um, I can hear you. Um, I have a question. Please yeah. go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Can you hear us? Okay. Uh, uh, do you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, so um, I, I'm, I have a question about this, um, your measurements, um, which supported uh, uh, what, um, one and one half. Uh, uh, could you please show this picture? Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, yeah. They're not there yet. Um, I'll take, let me. I'll no, just fast forward, but go ahead. Start answering the question. Ask, ask the question, and I'll show it as I go. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah th this one. Yeah. yeah. So um, uh, the, the, you you measure uh, the infrared absorption as function of frequency. Yes. Uh -huh. At different transverse fields. And then, um, oh, I am not quite sure that I understand what is. It, okay, um, so oh, this is a measurement of the energy of excitation, correct? Yeah. Uh, well, it's this. This is a plot of the uh, spectrum. So uh, of absorption. So presumably peaks here correspond to the energies of particles. Yeah. And then we plot the we plot the edges of this continuum on this side here. Do you need for that to change gap in, in the spectrum or it is not necessary? Well, we when we apply gap. the transverse field, that tunes the gap. Um, so the, so but, the gap itself comes down as a function of the transverse field. Yeah. And when the gap goes to zero, that's yeah, the phase transition. Yeah. Th this is gap in, in this um, part when you change uh, HX. Mm -hmm. Okay. But here the gap almost doesn't depend on HX. It is J to J. Uh, well, I don't know what you mean. Um, yeah, the, the, the gap here, the gap for this king is 2j. 2j times 1 minus, say, in the nearest neighbor models, 1 minus g, where g is the scaled field. So when g, as I've written it here, g is kind of written, it's the magnetic transverse field written in units of the exchange. So when g equals to 1, the gap goes to 0. Yeah. Uh -huh. So by it is um, I don't understand that. Just a moment. Let let me understand what happens with that. Mm -hmm. in, in transversal field, right? It's a it's it's a split between kinds of states. One way or another, there is a field here. There is an isotropy in back in here, so it, it's this flip. And the gap is going to zero at the quantum phase transition, as as one would expect. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, you you vary it by this g, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. But. On the other hand, what is it here? Is it here? It's really the, I mean, we're, we're, we're really varying the external transverse field. We apply, a, we are applying a DC external field in the transverse direction. And yeah. then at the same time, we're exciting it with an AC field in the terahertz range. Is it? So in, in, 
But we, when when uh, G is bigger than J, uh, again, uh, this is model of delta, yeah? So, yeah. And, yeah, so when G becomes bigger than, well, here G is a dimensionless number. So when G is bigger than one. Delta should be positive anyway, so. Right, so here it's absolute value. Yeah, this excitation above the ground state, right? The ground yeah. state. Yeah. So what what is here probably is g minus one. So that. Yeah, it's a model there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh. On the purple one, it's g minus one. Yeah. Well, okay. I wrote it as one minus g, but that's the same thing. It's the absolute value. Yeah. Well, it is modulus. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. And g is bigger than one in this case. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can I ask you, uh, please? You, you said that the, there is a sp it is spin one half system. So what, mm -hmm. what is drawn here? Uh, could you please say me what is x to prime or chi to prime? It is. Uh, oh, say like the dissipative the dissipative part of the susceptibility. Uh -huh. This is a cartoon, of course, here, but that's essentially what we're measuring as well. Imaginary part. Imaginary part of the susceptibility. Yeah, exactly. yeah. So the dissipation, yeah. Yeah. And yeah, why you. dissipation disappears in, in paramagnetic case? Uh, it, do, it doesn't. There's a, this is showing, you know, again, this is a cartoon, but um, this shows that there's a continuum of states that has a threshold of two delta on the Faro side. And then there's a peak which has an energy of delta on the parameter. Yeah, probably it, it simply goes uh, gradually to zero, but not, not. Is it exactly zero here? Well, this is, a, this is a, just a cartoon to give a feeling for what's going on. In any real experiment, of course, there's other, you know, there's finite temperature, there's, uh, there are impurity states, there are all kinds of other things. You know, we see very little um, you can see in the spectrum here, it's hard to tell from this plot, but you know, this is, this is pretty close to zero out here. That's a, that's a peak. These are the edges of the continuum here. And this is some peak down here. That's, or sorry, that's basically zero down there. So it's, it's basically zero below the gap. Yeah. Very small. Yep. Mm -hmm. But it's finite temperature. So there's always gonna be some thermally excited things that you could pu push around with the AC field. But it's very low temperature. You know, yeah. this energy here is, uh, you know, something of order um, uh, a At few milli electron. You measure that? Sorry. At what temperature did you measure that? These experiments were done at uh, two Kelvin, and the gap is close to, let's say, in temperature units, is close to twenty Kelvin. Twenty. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're ten times lower temperature. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Yep. It was a yeah, really very interesting. Yeah, so, Artem, you, you had a question. You were saying that it's, it's a spin one half system, right? Yeah. But what is an isotropy there then? So it's effective spin one half. There's a, there's a, let's see, do I have a slide? I did have a slide on that. Um, so uh, cobalt, there's uh, my, I had some, I did have a slide here, yeah. So, um, so what you get in, um, you get, it's a D, so it's cobalt, D7 environment with, in the octahedral environment, you get this um, uh, essentially high spin configuration that forms, which is actually L equals three and S equals three halves. And you get this effectively large J state that, so it's only effective spin one half. But it has uh, admixed, so it's a complicated spin orbital wave function that has all this stuff stuff moved into it, mixed into it. But it's uh, that it's it has a Kramer's degeneracy and it has a large projection on the actual spin one half, so you can have a spin flip. But essentially, because of spin orbit coupling, it's um, it's strongly anisotropic. Mm -hmm. the, the the way to think about it, you know, normally if it would be, uh, I mean, think of it as like a as a really high spin state. Where you would have all these mz orbitals, and uh, but you break their degeneracy in a way that's not just a, with applied field, you break them in some other fashion, and so you get the lowest state, which is strongly anisotropic, 
Mm -hmm. uh, so, so uh, real, real J is, is more than one half. It's, it's just the real J is more than one half. That's right. Yeah. So the real J is more than one half. Yeah. Yeah. The, the real J is more than one half, but it has a lot of S equals plus or minus one half mixed in to this Kramer's doublets. And so you can still, it, it behaves for all practical purposes, aside from the fact that it's very anisotropic, it behaves for all practical purposes, like a spin one half system, an, an Ising spin one half. The real big, the real J is bigger, yeah. One more question. Uh, okay. Do you hear me? Yes, no? yes. Okay. Uh, could you see the uh, interaction of not nearest neighbor, second neighbor? Uh huh. Uh, uh, because second neighbor is equivalent to interaction of, of these fermions. Which, uh, yeah, that's right. So, um, and it is do, also exactly solvable. Yeah, let me uh, let me show you where we see that. Um, okay, uh, here, right? Okay. So uh, at least this is where I think we have it, uh, where we see something like that. And, and it, it's probably the next nearest neighbor interaction is probably anti-ferromagnetic, but it's much smaller. And um, so this is the, the twisted Kitayev chain, the Hamiltonian for the twisted chain where you have icing axis, but the axes are canted with respect to each other. Mm -hmm. And what you get is this is an effective, when you apply a transverse field, you have this term here, which is uh, the transverse field, but then there's this term, which you can see switches sign from site to site. Uh -huh. And if, if, this was the, if this was the only, Ham, if these were all the terms in the Hamiltonian, you would actually get some exceptional field where you tune the hopping on, let's say, odd site on odd bonds to zero. Mm -hmm. And the result of that would be that the spectrum would completely narrow to some point and go to zero, be completely flat there. You would get these dimers. This is very much if you're familiar or people might be familiar with uh, uh, Susser for Heger model has this is one of the limits of the Susha for Heger model where you get these basically dimers that form which are completely localized because you've turned off, let's say the odd bonds. Mm -hmm. And what that you would see in the spectrum is that the spectrum would be completely, uh, would completely collapse. But it doesn't completely collapse. There's a little bit of width left here, even experimentally. Mm -hmm. And that's presumably due to these next nearest neighbor terms and, and other things that we didn't include. Mm -hmm. Do you have boundary states in this case? Uh, uh, boundary states, what do you mean? Um, well, if you have dimers, right, you can uh -huh. break the dimer or not. By yeah, you presumably would get that, but we never actually get to that limit because there are some other terms which don't allow the, the complete dimerization of the system. There's still, you, you almost turn off one of the bonds say the odd bonds, but you don't completely that, turn it off. That means that you would have, uh, even, even when you, when, when you split it, right, just a little bit, you still have boundary terms. You don't have to completely kill it. Uh-huh, and what would that do? Uh, it, that uh, the difference between, say, uh, exchange between this, uh, this link and this link, right, if, if it's not complete, if one of them is not zero, but, but they're just close to each other, then what, what, what happened is that the localized state is, uh, is localization length is bigger than just one bond. Mm -hmm. So you, you have localized state on the boundary, which, which can be quite big if, if the exchange interactions are close, close to each other. Yeah. When, when they become exactly the same, then, then the local, localization length becomes infinite. And uh, localization length is one of a logarithm of, of the ratio of the two exchange interactions. Of the bonds, yeah. So you, you, I see. Of course, when when you split them, you, you one way or another, it doesn't matter where your boundary is. But if you split it one way or another, you 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 at one point you you must have some boundary states on on, on those chains. Um, uh, returning to my yeah, question. Just a second, Valeria, let me finish. And if you I'm if sorry. you now have those chains, right, and you still have some uh, some boundary, but that many chains, those localized state will be localized on this boundary. But it's a three-dimensional boundary. They can actually move oh, around. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah. Um, no, haven't thought about it at all. So yeah, be interested to discuss more. Yeah. Yeah. That's that sounds. Yeah, that sounds interesting. I, I hadn't thought about it. All right. Excuse me, please. So uh, returning to my question, uh, if we have anti-ferromagnetic coupling of nearest neighbors, 
uh -huh. it, it is a product. Uh, it is it corresponds to to the repulsive interaction of uh, fermions. It is okay. something like a dagger, a on the one side and a or in continuous approximation it is simply a dagger, a square something like that and square um, times um, positive constant. Mm. So that is repulsion and that is just. Um, what, what what is necessary for um, uh, for stability? Uh, so that that is just um, problem which uh, is solved precisely uh -huh. by Doctor John Karepin and other people. Yeah. By whom? Sorry, say it again. The name Dr. again. John. Do you know this? Uh -huh. Idea of school that uh-huh uh okay got, i gotcha uh -huh. ripen is uh is probably it, it was at least it uh, i i have forgotten what but he has written a big book about that i see okay yeah that's interesting i'll, I'll write it i'll write that down but thanks that would be interesting because uh mm, the, this uh the spectrum changes now and probably you can modify a little bit this interaction just by your age <laughs> x okay yeah right uh-huh mm. yeah. okay uh, that, that that related question to that the, the schrodinger equation which you wrote that, that uh, yeah. the, the wave functions there is actually fermions yeah those particles are yeah. fermions do, do you see the fermion nature somehow oh that is string well, that, that, that is string, I know, but it's it's, it's the ends of the string. So, it, but if, if you write Schrodinger equation for them, you, you wrote it just a single particle. Yeah. It doesn't matter what, what the statistic doesn't matter. But in reality, when you have many of them, they actually behave as fermions. They should behave as fermions, right? Yeah. And so the wave function is more, more complicated, just simple product. And yeah. You're supposed to have some Fermi surface there, and uh, maybe, I don't know. It's, what would you see? There? Well, it's the system is gapped, generically gapped. So I don't. We wouldn't see some, but uh, maybe we would see there's some consequence of this at the at the critical point. Yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah. Those those fermionic description is is working only at the critical point. Actually, yeah. I'm not sure about quantum critical point. I know that. Well, okay. Well, it's it's a little mm -hmm. beyond my expertise here. Valeria should know that. <laughs> Well, can you can you actually see those, that the fermionic nature of those uh, of those particles? Those are fermions, right? What yeah, they are fermions. Yeah, that's correct. Um, and the, the independent fermions are given by yeah, just not by this string transformation Wigner. Just a moment. Let let me remember what do we have here. Uh -huh. We have. Um, this is completely, um, completely uh, field bent. Yeah. The, yeah. What happens that at, at some point uh, the, the, there appears a gap in this band. So it, it's when you have a completely field, the Fermi surface doesn't exist. Right, right, but is it is it possible to to do some measurements? That maybe, but I don't know. But by, maybe the, by magnetic field, I don't know. Right. So what, what, what is the field. consequence of the of the fact that they are fermions? Would be quite but but with magnetic field, it doesn't have exact solution. <laughs> Only but, in one point, and even this point is is imaginary magnetic field, not real. Yeah, but I, it's uh, the fermionic nature should not depend on whether it's exact or not, right? It's the fermions of bosons. And... Oh, that 
that a good idea, but I don't know the answer. Mm. There are some experiments you actually can do to say what is the statistics of, of those particles. Yeah, there's, I mean, there was a claim um, by Ong's group on this material that at the quantum critical point, they would see linear and T heat capacity. Mm. But um, I think the difficulty there is that uh, the, the real phase transition at zero temperature, of course, is not this 1D1, mm. which we're kind of discussing. It's the, the, the real phase transition is the actual three dimensional phase right. transition of the real three dimension. So, you know, we're, we're talking about this 1D transition, which is really kind of like a, a no, ghost transition. Just a second, just, just to be clear, that, that fermion sign is in, in 2D, right? Uh, well, you, you're talking about one, your 2D is, we're talking about one plus 1D, right? No, 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 just normal, normal uh, 2D. Um, Artem, yeah. uh, Artem, I, I have an idea that probably we should stop you're right. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. We we're folding everyone up. <laughs> and, and that was Maybe I don't know. We if there. This is of course very interesting, and it's a, but it's an advanced topic. So I don't know if people have any other uh, questions from. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So let's well, let's ask. So, is, are there any other questions? Uh, right. I probably do have to go in about five minutes, but I'm happy to take other uh, other other questions. That. Uh... All right. I don't see any questions. So, let's. Uh... Let's just thank the speaker again. I'm sorry we took took most of your no, time. No, no, it's uh, I always enjoy to discuss, and I'm, I'm you know I'm happy I could make it virtually. Uh, finally, I hope. Uh, yeah, we'll. we'll uh, I'll, 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 I hope to visit in person. I will invite you again, so we can discuss it okay. more. That would be great. All right. Okay. Well, okay. thank you very much. Okay. Good. Uh, okay. Take care, everyone. Uh, uh, bye bye. Okay. I. Uh, it is your okay, please.